the the hard part i think as some like working on creative type stuff is to try to think about like who is this for right and i think different mediums are different right like a lot of art is for the artist and like if it doesn't resonate with other people then that's fine like that they're that i think that's a very valid choice to make with certain types of, of art let's say but in startups and product like it is never for you like and it should never be for you at the end of the day you're building products you need people to use it like you can you can really only do that by making yourself like far subservient <laughs> to what your customers need and what your users need today i'm speaking with jake singer co-founder of Swapstack. If you missed the introduction to this video and would like some more background on what Swapstack is, make sure to check the link in the description. And as always, if you're enjoying these conversations, make sure to like this video and to subscribe to the channel. You're listening to User Stories, episode number 10 with Jake Singer. All right, Jake, well, thank you so much for, for coming on the show. And I want to talk about Swapstack and about the growth you guys are experiencing there and, and just everything that you're up to working on that product. But my first question for you is, what is a flywheel? Uh, a flywheel is, so I guess, first and foremost, a reference to uh, my email newsletter that I started writing uh, at this point well over a year ago. No, two years ago. Um, and it explored business flywheels, which are essentially systems of growth for companies in general. I mean, really it's, it's more of a general term, not just for business and more from like mechanics, I think, um, where basically there's the application of leverage in a system. And the idea is as the flywheel spins, it, it spins faster and faster as it goes. It's sort of like a self-reinforcing loop. Um, I had been introduced to the concept uh, because I worked at Amazon for a long time um, up until 2020 and the probably the most famous flywheel in the world is the Amazon flywheel. Um, I, I don't know how famous it actually is compared to like actually famous things, but in the like business world and tech world, it's relatively well known. It's, you know, the legend has it that Jeff Bezos drew it on a napkin one night at a bar, and it describes essentially how Amazon's business is structured to grow. Um, and so that was something we were sort of taught when we came in as new employees, and you know, in each of the different teams that I worked on at Amazon. Uh, kind of made a point of trying to uh, think through and describe sort of what is our specific component of the flywheel or like what is our flywheel as a team. And so something that was something I had practiced thinking about. And basically when I left Amazon, which I'm assuming we'll talk a little bit about, um, I, uh, yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to try a bunch of different projects. And so one of them was writing a newsletter and that was a topic that felt pretty natural to me. Um, and so, so that's how I got into it. Okay. And so I'm reading from the flywheel, your, your newsletter. You, you said, when I started the flywheel, it was a truly throw or it was truly a throw spaghetti on the wall and see what sticks kind of moment. I had just resigned from Amazon for the second time in approximately eight months and wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do next. All I knew for certain was that I wanted to never need to go back for a third time. Why did you want that? How did you know that for certain? Hmm. I had an interesting journey uh, with Amazon. I, I was there for about five years. And uh, yeah, as you as you read, I, I did resign twice in pretty quick succession. I, I think that was some kind of record. I don't know. Um, but essentially, the the key point there is not needing to have, you know, to go back. Um, so there's a couple of components there. There's sort of the like, loving what you do and being happy in your job sort of component. And then there's the like, um, uh, I guess like vulnerable financial position of like needing to go take a high paying job that you might not like. Um, and so, you know, that was a result of my personal journey there where after about four years or so, I came to the conclusion that like, this is not the right place for me or the right type of place for me. Um, can tell more about sort of like why I got to that conclusion, but just in the interest of answering the question um, in a slightly more concise fashion, <laughs> um, you know, it, it actually felt like a lot of work to actually go through with resigning. It was something I had tried to do for a while and just like couldn't pull the trigger on. Um, and finally was able to do it. Um, and then I found myself back there like four months later. <laughs> and that just felt like a really tough uh, personal kind of failure. I mean, it's a very privileged failure to like, oh crap, I have this like very awesome job at this cool company that pays me super well. Um, but in the context of sort of like everything I had attempted to do and the progress that I'd made felt like not the right thing. And it was, it was, you know, the beginning of the pandemic, the world was sort of like exploding and it was a very convenient option. So there were reasons why I did it um, that are 
like justify justified for sure. Um, but yeah, I think after going back the second time, looking around after the like initial excitement of you know the new team had had worn off after like a month or two, I was looking around. I was like, wait, I I'm still here. Like, how did this happen? Um, and so you know, only stayed another maybe four months after that. And um, when I left the second time, I was very resolved to. Um, just finding a, actually for real this time, finding another path. Um, and so that's the flywheel was one of a handful of things I was trying, but that was the spirit. And was that more out of like, like, have you always had this kind of entrepreneurial itch or was it more like you said in this, in this quote here, like out of necessity, more like, Hey, I don't want to be stuck in a position where I'm not doing something that I absolutely love. Uh, but I continue doing it because the money's great and, you know, golden handcuffs, so to speak. So, like, have you always had that entrepreneurial itch? I can't say that I have. I don't think mm, that would be super uh, accurate. Um, although when I really think about my career path, I think there were clues I could have probably picked up on earlier and I didn't. Um, you know, just as one example, I just really, I remember my first job out of college that like one of the you know, I, I, at this point in my career, I think of my jobs in the form of like the interview stories that I tell about them. Um, and I remember this first job out of college where like the key interview story that I told from that experience um, was the sort of like reaction to a project where the the message was like, this is how we've always done it. And I, you know, it was very inefficient and I tried sort of like optimizing and making it better and like faced all this resistance. And so that was like a clue I probably could have listened to. Of, like I probably am not like fit for like these super corporate environments, um, but didn't do anything about it for probably another 12 years or so. Um, I, yeah, this was probably a more recent realization. Um, I think particularly as a result of, like I, I went to grad school before Amazon and I had a bunch of student debt from that. Um, and it was like two, two and a half years in to my time at Amazon where I was, you know, Amazon stock price had done super well, I was very lucky. Um, and so I was able to pay off my loans really quickly. And that was the first, it felt like, maybe it wasn't really, but it felt like the first time in my life where I didn't have a very clear next step. It was like, well, it's not get a job after college. It's not get into grad school. It's not get the job out of grad school. So now it's like, well, I have no more debt. Like this is cool. But what do I like for the first time felt like I was actually asking myself, what do I want to do? Um, and so it, I think that's kind of where it all started, you know, maybe three, three years into my time at Amazon. Um, so I don't know how many years ago that was at this point, a uh, handful of years. Uh, and I think that's kind of where, where it, all, it all just started snowballing from there. I started realizing things that I really wasn't that happy with at my time, you know, during my experience there. And I think it just kind of picked up momentum from there. Yeah. Well, I mean, preparing for, for this interview, I spent quite a bit of time reading your newsletter and you're a really good writer. And I think that like, yeah, um, you know, I, I assume a very creative person just from reading your newsletter. I think like creative people, it's, it's, you often see a lot of creative people doing entrepreneurial things, starting companies and stuff like that. So it's not a, not a huge surprise to me, at least my gut would tell me that you'd kind of go down that path from reading your newsletter. And obviously like, you know, so you start the flywheel, you have some success with it, you grow your subscriber base and you're at on deck at the time uh, where you meet Jake, who became your co-founder at Swapstack. And you guys are working, you discover on kind of similar things. You start talking about these ideas that you have that eventually led to Swapstack. There was one part where you were talking about meeting Jake where you said, after a long period of co-founder dating, we decided to go for it. We officially teamed up to start building a company. So I'm curious to know, can you tell me more about the co-founder dating process? What red flags do you look for? How do you know if um, the co-founder you're dating is is the one? <laughs> Uh, excellent question. Um, I, I mean, that was my first and only time doing it. So I am by far or by no means an expert on this topic at all. Um, so all I can say is it's kind of like what we did and how we approached it. Um, I would say like the, I didn't really set out to start a company per se. I think I, I had this idea for Swapstack and Jake had it kind of in his own form. Um, you know, we don't like fight over whose idea it was. We kind of each had it in a slightly different format. Um, but from my perspective, I had this idea from very early on while writing the flywheel. And I kind of had this like, even though all I was doing at the time was like writing business cases for other companies, I kind of had this like slightly, I guess, like imposter syndrome, me slightly self-critical view of like, 
that's too obvious of an idea. There's no way that like this is actually a good idea. And I kind of like didn't, I like thought about it. It kept coming up. I'd like, you know, suppress it. Um, and then eventually it just like, beca- it felt too, too, too obvious and too, um, I don't know. I couldn't ignore it anymore after a certain amount of time. And so, uh, I, yeah, I wasn't on deck. I was meeting a bunch of people. I wanted to do something interesting and exciting. I didn't know what exactly. And then this idea just kept popping up um, in, in my own head, at least. Um, so when I met Jake, it kind of, it did feel very serendipitous because I was also exploring, like, you know, I was really into like climate, for example. And I was like, oh, maybe I can like use this as a chance to, you know, despite having zero experience, like do something right. Uh, that's good for the world. <laughs> um, and, but he was sort of like in a very similar headspace and, uh, yeah, I think it, it became pretty clear to me that this was what I wanted to do. Um, the co-founder dating piece specifically, um, or, or I guess I, the reason I'm giving all that background is because just to sort of paint the picture of like where my mindset was at the time, I was very much like not, oh, I've got to go build a huge company or anything like that. I just was like, I think this is a, a product that needs to exist in the world. I don't know what it can be. Um, and I don't want to like pre-commit to some, I guess the biggest thing I was worried about was uh, teaming up with somebody who was very much on the like venture capital, like massive company path or bust. Um, and so that was the biggest thing I was watching out for um, in, in sort of like a high level perspective. I think then there were a lot of the like sort of interpersonal things that I was uh, very cautious about as well, where like it was just very clear to me that, you know, working with a co-founder is a very serious, uh, at least working relationship, if not more. Like, you know, you just spent so much time with this person and you have to really, you know, to the best of your ability, try to, to suss out if you actually want to do that. Um, from all the different angles. And obviously different things are important to different people. Um, but for me, and actually for Jake as well, I think we were super aligned about the questions that we were asking each other. And it was really around like, how do we how do we resolve issues when they come up? Because it seemed pretty clear, like issues will definitely come up. <laughs> um, doesn't seem avoidable. Um, and so yeah, just trying to, to make sure that we had some compatibility there and like uh, didn't think, you know, at least claimed not to take things too personally or any of that. Um, and, you know, as, as, as we work through issues. And so it was like that kind of stuff. And I think we just, we wanted to, I guess, give it enough time and like really sit with it. Right. So like having these conversations was nice, but then also just like not rushing the decision and giving ourselves like a solid like month or two. Um, I think those were all kind of key elements to this, but um, ultimately, you know, I have to say it's, it's worked out really well from a, at least working relationship perspective. Um, I think we, we both like each other. We both respect each other. Um, we've gotten really good at resolving conflicts. Uh, it definitely didn't start off <laughs> as good as it is now. But um, but yeah, all in all, I don't know if I credit just the dating process to that, but for whatever reason, um, it's it's turned out to be a really good relationship. Yeah. So having those um, those early difficult conversations and making your making sure you're aligned about about the big. Th- it's it's so funny as you were speaking. I was thinking it really is like a dating process. In the sense that, like, if you're looking for a serious partner, a serious romantic partner, um, you, you know, there's always this, like, dance, like, how soon do you have these conversations about the big things that, you know, might be a, a serious uh, red flag or whatever it is in the relationship that causes it not to work out. And so for you guys, you said at least one of the examples that you gave right there was not working with someone who was really driven by like, you know, VC funding and wanting to grow a big company. Why was that important for you? Yeah. Well, and, and before I answer that question, I just, just to cue off of what you were saying, I think for whatever reason, it's, um, well, I guess two, two thoughts popped in my mind as you were just talking. One is relative to like romantic relationships. I think for whatever reason, it's a lot more like awkward to bring those big questions up in like a romantic relationship very early on versus a business relationship where it's better to bring it up earlier. You think? It should be. Yeah, you should. Right. I mean, I think so. I mean, if there are things that really matter to you. Um, and the other was like being on the like product development side, you know, it does feel a little bit like anti sort of like agile, right? You're like worrying about things. You don't even know if you have to worry about them yet. Um, so it's like, oh, how are we going to IPO in 10 years? Right. Like it's kind of a ridiculous conversation to have when you haven't even started working on something. Um, not that that's exactly the conversation, but you get the idea. Like, so, so it does feel premature. There's no question about it, but I think, um, yeah, I think that's a good segue to, to, to your question. I think for me, it was important because, uh, you know, to be honest, I think it was a, a reaction to my experience at Amazon. Um, and I, I, obviously there's a million different ways to build a company and 
not everything has to be Amazon. And if you, if you can turn a company into Amazon, like, great, go for it. Um, that's certainly not what we expect or, or, or assume will happen. Um, but I, I think for me, I just, I was really getting excited about the sort of like creator like indie hacker kind of world. Um, it felt like the type of lifestyle that I wanted to have. Um, I know the word lifestyle has a lot of connotations in this in this space, and we talk about all that. But like, like more so the the idea that you can do it on your own terms is really really what mattered to me. Um, and I also I still am and still was figuring out what that means exactly. Like, what are those terms? Um, and I think that'll always be a moving target to a certain extent um, because we're people and people change and people grow. But um, but to me, venture capital represents or taking on a large amount of venture capital represents that you no longer can do it on your terms. You're doing it on somebody else's terms. And whether or not those, whether or not that other person's terms are like bad or evil or oppressive or any of that, like that's debatable. And it's probably different in every situation. But the end of the, at the end of the day, it's somebody else's terms and not yours. Um, and so that's, I think, what I've always wanted to avoid. I got the sense uh, reading as you were talking about the early days too, when you and Jake are going back and forth, there's this tricky part of, um, of, of kind of going all in, deciding that you're both all in on this project, you know, and, and again, uh, not to, not to just keep bringing up romantic relationships, but that's kind of, there's a, there's a similar thing there. I think where like, you know, often in romantic relationships, there's one party that's more into the other, or one person that's more into the other person than the other, or the idea of a relationship, let's say, and so did you guys experience that at all when you were talking about um, about starting Swapstack? I got the sense that there was this kind of like back and forth and this this hesitancy from your writing, at least. I got the idea that there was this hesitancy a little bit on both parties from both sides to dive fully into it. So like, am I right about that? What was that moment for you when you're like, I mean, of course, I know that you guys both got hired or, or the business got acquired by On Deck at first. But like, was that the big moment where you both jumped into it? Or was there, when I guess did you guys decide to both jump in and commit to this thing 100%? I, I think you're, you are right about that. Um, I guess the caveat is that it's now been a couple of years since these, all these conversations were all going. So it's not super, like the timeline isn't super fresh in my mind, I guess. Um, but that being said, I think, yeah, there was some conversation for a while about like each of us maybe doing it 50% of our time. Um, and I don't really remember why we were hesitant. I think in part it was because we weren't sure that this was the right thing to build and that like, we weren't sure how much potential it had. I think that was definitely part of it. Um, which I think is always going to be the case early days. So at some point you have to just like, you, you know, there's like Jake talks about this a lot, like, like kind of like not with that attitude sort of thing. Like, well, if you work on it 50% of the time, you're making it much less likely to ever be successful than if you actually just went for it. Um, but if that's a really like, you know, at the time I was like really into people like Daniel Vassallo on Twitter and these like portfolio bets sort of concepts. I'm not really into that so much anymore. Um, but at the time, could, I was you, could you tell me more about that? I'm not a, I'm not familiar with them. Yeah. There I mean, was a Twitter, Twitter guy who I actually got to know a little bit personally, just cause he had his whole story was he had, um, he had a really nice job at, uh, at Amazon at AWS as a software engineer. And you around the same time that I was like struggling and trying to get out. Um, he wrote this blog post that went viral about like why I gave up this $500,000 job a year at AWS and like went on my own. And so that was like a, like a very influential thing for me at that time in my life. Um, and basically he ended up creating this like big Twitter following around kind of around like how to grow on Twitter, which is a little bit of like a red flag, but also, um, this idea of like small bets, right? Like don't go all in with any one thing, like diversify your risk, work on a bunch of different projects. Cause you don't know what's going to work. That was sort of like his concept. And I was, I was kind of buying into that at that time. I think that was part of it. I wasn't the whole story though. I think the other part of it was, um, was the on deck piece. So yeah, th there's a lot that was going on between us and on deck. Personally, I had just written an article about on deck about a month or two earlier. And, um, I, that wasn't the, that's where I got to meet the on deck co-founders and, and started to get closer with them. Um, and so they were like together with them, I was exploring what could it look like for me to come actually work there. Cause they, you know, we wrote the article together going into their strategy and then they kept like pinging me afterwards. Like, Hey, what do you think about that? And I was like, you know, I don't work for you. Maybe, maybe you can pay me and I can answer your questions. Um, and so we kind of started there. Um, and, and it turns out Jake was having similar conversations with them about like completely other types of roles. It was kind of by coincidence that that was the case. So yeah, we kind of came into the relationship, both of us, like exploring stuff with on deck. I was also like looking at a couple of other jobs that I had had kind of had it in flight 
um, you know, I was still open. Like I said, I wasn't fully into the like, well, I'm going to go start a startup or nothing kind of thing. I was, I was really like open to a lot of different outcomes. And so I think it was just like a lot of, like a lot of different sort of alternatives were kind of playing around in both of our minds. And, and I, I don't think it was a case where one of us was further along, like more committed than the other. I think we actually were both. It was, I think, very beneficial. Like if only one of us had been like grappling with it and the other one was like, no, I want to do this a hundred percent. That probably would have been a lot more challenging. Um, but it felt pretty equitable. Um, yeah, the, the moment, I guess you also asked like, what was the moment that we went all in? I think, frankly, it was like the classic like MVP startup story of like, we figured out like the scrappiest possible version of a way to validate that this was a thing people might want. And it just worked. I mean, it, you know, it, we basically ended up building a, we, we created a Slack community, a free Slack community, built a couple of Airtable forms. Uh, we like basically made them public <laughs> and we tried to make matches between um, two sides of a marketplace, which we can talk about. Uh, and, and yeah, there just was like a lot more interest than we expected. Like we weren't super scientific and rigorous or like what the number was we were looking for, but it was just a lot more, um, I guess, activity than we probably assumed it would be like right off the bat. So that was a huge contributing factor to it. Um, and, and we, yeah, at some point along that whole journey, we were just like, all right, I think there's something here. Let's, let's build this for real. Yeah, that's uh that's great. You, you actually beat me to the next thing that I wanted to talk about because I loved that part of the article when you're talking about those early days inside of the Slack channel. And you explained a little bit in what you just said there, what, how you guys were actually operating this thing. It was super scrappy Slack, a lot of like, Hey, you're a marketer that is looking for, you know, people who have newsletters manually matching them together. And you, you said, here's a quote, you said with do things that don't scale at the top of our mind, our MVP was not really a product at all. We spent lots of time talking to potential customers on both sides seeing what it would take to broker sponsorship deals. I've certainly felt, I think this is um, a common thing in the space that we're in. I mean, you as a, as a company building on Bubble, which I want to get into, um, and just the no-code space in general. I've certainly felt this myself when I've had ideas for products that there's this tendency to just start building right away. And you guys seem to do the exact opposite of that. Um, and I, I think at the time too, correct me if I'm wrong, you had the capability to do it. Like you knew how, I think you had a little bit of, um, of a software development background. And then I think at the time you, you knew how to build on bubble too. So you could have, if you wanted to build out your first product, why was it important for you not to do that? Um, and at what point did you have enough information or, or decide that, yeah, I, I, you know, let's actually build this first version of our product out. So I guess the first question first, why was it important for us to do that? I mean, I think it's not, not unique to us, but it really was a, 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 um, a function of wanting to validate the, the problem. Um, you know, the, and in case anyone listening doesn't know what SwapSec is, I'll give a quick two sentence summary of, of like what the general business is. Um, essentially, it is a platform that connects email newsletter writers with advertisers. Um, and so my path in was pretty clear. I was writing the flywheel. It was starting to grow. I wanted to monetize it. And, uh, I was really, uh, into Packy McCormick's newsletter and he, he had decided to go, despite the fact that like Substack was blowing up and the subscription newsletter thing was becoming a really, um, big thing in 2020, you know, the pandemic year, um, he was bucking that trend and going the advertising route and making so much money doing it. Um, and, and he and I talked about it a bunch and, um, yeah, I think, I, you know, as the flywheel, I was like, okay, well, I'm a small newsletter. I'm, I'm not packy, but maybe I could be someday. And, uh, just was kind of surprised to see how the state of the tools out there for, for this sort of thing. Um, and so that was my path into this. Um, but, but that was what, like an end of one. That was my experience. And like, I wasn't sure, um, you know, lots of things we weren't sure about, like how many other publishers actually want to go the sponsorship route versus the subscription route. I think that was one big vector. I think uh, the other was how many advertisers are actually interested in this channel in general. Uh, it's, you know, for whatever reason, even though email marketing has been around for decades, this like email newsletter advertising thing in this current iteration or incarnation of it uh, feels new um, or has felt new. And so that was a bit, bit of a question, like how, you know, how does it appeal? to advertisers who, who actually have to spend real money to do this. Um, 
and there were probably, you know, a number of other questions that we were kind of contemplating. And so, so really it was around like validating that those, those questions, the problems and um, seeing if it was worth, you know, like we just talked about, it was a, a moment where we were deciding if we wanted to actually like spend, you know, at least months, if not years on this thing. So I um, felt very risky to do that without having some, some evidence. Um, so that was the first question. The second question was like, what was it that led us to going all in and actually building it? Um, I don't think of it as sort of like a binary thing. I think we just continually iterated on that initial MVP. So like the first, if you want to call it the first product, I mean, you can call any of it a product. Um, but if you want to call the first bubble thing that we built was, um, was an invoicing tool. <laughs> so basically we would use the MVP and then when it was time to actually strike a deal, uh, we would send them to our, plat our platform <laughs> on bubble where, you know, built hooked up a couple of Stripe APIs where they could like create an invoice. Um, and so that was to basically prove like, well, people actually like use our platform. Do they, will, will transactions actually occur through this thing? Um, and then we just built it up from there. So I, I don't think it was ever any one moment where we're like, okay, now we have to stop and spend four months building a big product. Um, I think we've, you know, we've tried, we haven't always been successful. We've tried to keep it very iterative, very small uh, incremental steps forward based on what we're hearing and seeing from our customers um, at every moment. So um, yeah, I don't really think of it in that way that there was some like aha moment and we're like, okay, now we're gonna build it. And and why um why do things that don't scale? I've heard that phrase too. I'm curious to know actually if you heard it from the same place that I did because I think it's a it's a common piece of advice in the startup world. But how did you um, come to that? Come to appreciate that idea of doing things that don't scale in the beginning? I so I'll take a step back and then I'll answer this in a second. But I think my journey. So my role at Amazon was a product manager. And um, my journey there was, I, I mean, to me, it was interesting. I didn't, nobody there taught me like, what does it mean to be a product manager? It's like a weird concept that they would hire all these, they hire all these PMs out of business school and then they like, don't really tell them what to do. It's just like very strange. Um, and so everyone's kind of trying to figure it out on their own. Um, and, you know, I had five years of experience there. And, and basically I learned from like what seemed to be very, like, and I worked on teams that didn't have a lot of success, just candidly, like. Like I was always on teams that uh, were building kind of like speculative products. And Amazon at that time, especially, I think a little bit less so now, Amazon was very famous for like, well, we're gonna just take new shots in all sorts of different areas and 90% of them are gonna fail, but 10% of them are gonna succeed. And you know, maybe it's the portfolio of small bets just like times a billion, right? Cause it's at Amazon budgets. Um, and, and, and you know, I thought, I always thought that was an interesting way to build a company and maybe it's like, from Jeff Bezos' perspective, a really cool like portfolio that he can have. But for each individual person working on all these teams that you already know are going to fail, like it, what does that say about their careers and their experiences? That, that, it was really interesting to, to see that and go through that a couple cycles of like, you know, this big launch that just fails. <laughs> um, just just kind of kind of a wild ride in general. Um, and so my like product management experience and knowledge was really the result in a lot of cases of observing things at Amazon that didn't seem like they made a lot of sense uh, and then trying to fight against the tide of like this big organization to try to like, you know, implement things that I was like seeing on Twitter or reading in books or like I was basically trying to self-educate myself outside of Amazon and then bring it to Amazon and had like sometimes had success, sometimes didn't. Um, but ultimately that was just like a, after five years, I got tired of that <laughs> uh, general process. Um, so the like the reason I'm bringing all of that up is because like I had this like brain full of like things that you're the way you're supposed to build products, but a lot less of like practical experience of actually shipping these products in the way that I feel like was the right way. Um, and so, so yeah, I, you know, I came into this with a lot of like good ideas that I haven't experienced fully. Um, so do things that don't scale is maybe an example of one of those things. Whereas like, I, I understand conceptually why something like that makes sense. And I think it's because, well, you do that at a certain stage before you know that scale is coming. Right. So, if you, if it takes you an extra, like two weeks to build something to be more scalable or, or, but you have like a 99% chance of never reaching that scale for it to matter. Um, it's probably not a good trade-off. Um, and, but actually being in that moment, I didn't know, like, or still, you know, I didn't know what it was going to feel like. And it, and it was a new feeling to be like, oh, we're in this world. Like there really might not be users who use this. And actually it turns out it's like a pretty easy choice to make. Cause you're like, not it's sort of like the, like, how do we IPO in 10 years conversation before you've even like written a line of code? Like, why are we building for scale? Why are we building a tool before we know that users even want it? Um, it in practice, 
I thought it was going to be harder to like have that discipline, but actually in practice, it felt really obvious. Um, it was just like, well, of course we're not going to do that because we don't have people yet. Go get the people first. Um, I feel like you're an outlier in that into. sense too. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I feel like you're an outlier no, in that okay. sense. Cause I feel like, um, I know I've felt it myself. What, why do you think it is like what, what's going on psychologically there where people mm. feel like not necessarily to build something that scales, but it's, I, th I think the concern where people feel like they want to make sure they're building something that's totally scalable and, and doing all of these things is the same concern that people have, or this, it's that same, like maybe nagging sense of insecurity when they feel like they have to design and have things perfectly and have every single feature that they're, they have in mind in their, their dream product, you know, 10 years down the road. What do you think it is there and why were you, why was it seemingly from the way that you're speaking about it so easy for you to kind of um, detach from that? And I'll say it's gotten much harder as we've gotten more and more users um, because now we know when we ship things, people will see it. At the beginning, it was just very clear, right? Like people aren't going to see this if you ship this tomorrow, so why even bother? Um, so now we have to actively try harder to like in, enforce this sort of discipline. And, and we can definitely talk about that and some of the like good and bad that's coming with all that. Um, so, so I don't want to say like uh, it's easy forever. It's just, you know, in the very early days, um, it felt intuitive to me. Um, but I think you're right that there is this thing for a lot of people in, in startups or even probably bigger companies where they feel it's the tendency to overbuild stuff. Um, uh, as, as if I would summarize everything you described in like two words. Um, and I think, I think, I, you know, I don't know, I'm not, um, I, I'm not like clairvoyant. I don't know exactly all the things that are going on, but I think it's a f at least a few different things. I think one is like, um, there's definitely fear. I mean, for sure. Like, oh, I'm going to launch something. It's not going to work because that button wasn't pretty. Um, and I think it takes some experience to, to internalize the fact that actually like it's not going to be because that button isn't pretty. It's going to be because you didn't understand your customer's needs very well and you didn't build the right products. Um, uh, so I think there's maybe a little bit of a lack of experience. I think I, I think I've probably seen that a little bit, probably more in the no code space because I think people are very focused on like how to use the tool and how to build stuff as opposed to like what to build and how to figure that out. Um, I don't know if you would agree with that, but um, uh, yeah. So at least those two things, um, and I think maybe like a third is like it's comfortable. It's comfortable and easy to just go into your hole and spend a month in bubble like perfecting something. It's a lot scarier to like launch something into the world and like get feedback. And so I think there's like for sure like a defense mechanism or something. I, mean, I guess I'm veering into like armchair psychologist territory here a little bit too much, but 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 something like that, right? Where it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot, you feel more protected. Like there's no real risk there. You can you can definitely build forever um, and it's fun, especially if you like, like the tools you're using, um, getting something out there and you know, being vulnerable to people not liking it or not using it, that's a lot less fun if it doesn't go well. And so it just feels scary, I think, for a lot of people. Yeah, I was thinking, um, I think it's a, a David Foster Wallace, the, the author, uh, like a, a quote that he said, um, he was talking about the creative process and he was describing it as, I'm going to screw this up completely, but describing it as like a tragedy uh, in the sense that like when you have this idea in your mind for whatever it is, a company, a song, piece of art, whatever. Um, there's something tragic because actually trying to bring that idea into fruition, you destroy that ideal in your head, this perfect thing. Cause every time you try to put something down on paper or create wh whatever it is, um, it's never, it never matches up to that ideal. So I think that probably happens too, and probably feeds into this comfort that we feel. I've definitely done it myself, like kind of hiding behind closed doors, working on my project and fantasizing about, um, it just being big without actually like showing it to anyone, you know? I, yeah. And I think, I think that's right. And I think the thing to the, the hard part, I think as some like working on creative type stuff is to try to think about like, who is this for? Right. And I think, I think different mediums are different, right? Like a lot of art is for the artist and like, if it doesn't resonate with other people, then that's fine. Like that there, that I think that's a very valid choice to make with certain types of, of art, let's say, not to say that, bubbling is art, although maybe in some cases you could, you could say that. Um, but in startups and product, like it is never for you, like, and it should never be for you. And I think that's another thing that's like not super intuitive for a lot of people. Um, and, and, you know, especially so, and I think there's also a distinction to be made between things that are like fun side projects and things that like, okay, this has to actually work and I have to actually be able to like make money from this as a, 
as a, for my life, right? Um, and for my co-founder's life and the people we hire's life. And there's sort of like a, like, um, to, to me, the like, yeah, like there's no room for it to just be like a vanity project that's like just for my personal whims of it, like looking nice, right? Like I, I think that's that's part of it too. And I don't know how many people start off that way in their no-code projects, especially. Like I think a lot of people start off with like a hobbyist kind of attitude, which is also totally fine. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, you're building products, you need people to use it. Like you can you can really only do that by making yourself like far subservient <laughs> to what your customers need and what your users need. Um, but I don't think that comes naturally to a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right about that. I feel like I could go down that rabbit hole with you, and we could talk for hours about that. But I want to. There's other things that I want to get into. But uh, let's let's talk about your tech stack a bit because um, your tech stack at first, like we've already said, was essentially a Slack channel. Um, and why after that did you decide on Bubble? Was it an easy decision? Um, what were those conversations like about tech stack in the early days? It's a good question. Um... So the conversations around tech stack in the early days were basically making a choice between me building it in bubble or me building it in code. Um, I, I, for whatever reason, we didn't really seriously consider hiring an engineer. Um, I think part of, I, I don't really, like I said, there's been enough time that I don't really remember these conversations very clearly, but I think one of the things like that, one of the things I wanted to do was to actually be able to build whatever work I was going to build and not like be the, just the manager of it. Um, I had, you know, that previous year spent a bunch of time learning or maybe two years learning how to code. Um, and then I found my way into bubble at a certain point. Um, and I just really enjoyed it to be honest. It just, you know, scratched uh, an inch in my brain, I guess that I, that I needed or wanted. Um, and so I don't really recall if the conversation with Jake was like the only way I'm going to do this is if I'm building it and then like we'll find a way for that to be true. But but considering the fact that we didn't even consider hiring an engineer, it sounds like something I might have said. Um, and, you know, ultimately, I think Jake didn't know that, didn't really know anything about Bubble. Um, I think we also looked at Share Tribe or one of those marketplace tools um, that were like a little bit more forced structure. So we were debating a couple of different options. Um I eventually, you know, I started playing around with like a little bit what it would look like if I actually built this in full code. I had been learning React um, and pretty quickly ran into some pretty serious limits. And I was like, I don't think this is a good idea for, for, for us to build a thing on. Um, and so then the question was, is Bubble, is Bubble like good enough? Can it handle what we want to do? Can it handle like at least this next step in product? Um, and I didn't really know, like I had experience building a bubble, but I didn't really know a lot about how it worked behind the scenes or, or sort of like what the limits and limitations were. Um, so there was a little bit of research to be done there. Uh, Jake didn't know much about it. So I had to kind of like pitch him on it a little bit. Um, yeah, I don't really know exactly how we ended up deciding to do it. I think part of it was like related to that incremental approach that we were taking. So it was sort of like, didn't feel like it was a forever decision. It was like, okay, well, we'll start in Bubble, and you know, Bubble will be the next step out of Slack and Airtable. Um, and I mean, even the first Bubble, like I mentioned, it was like an invoicing tool, and then bit, like the next step after that was we added a gallery of listings from either side. But all we did there was embed the Airtable <laughs> into a web page, um, and uh, yeah, so it was sort of like a. I don't think we realized that we were going to be on Bubble for the long term. Um, I, you know, I think now we probably would say that there's at least a very good chance, if not for sure, that that's what's going to happen. Um, so yeah, it wasn't like this big major decision, I don't think. It was sort of more, uh, yeah, that seems like right for the time being. Yeah, well, like reading um, reading your article and hearing you you talk about these early days in the Slack channel, it seems like a, just a great fit. But like you just said, you're still entirely on bubble. Um, and you just alluded to the fact that like, you'll probably be for a while. Have you run into any limitations? Um, what is your experience like now after having been on bubble with a product that lots and lots of people are using, uh, for quite some time now? I would say largely excellent, to be honest. I don't want to just dive into the limitations. Like I really want to give bubble team to like a ton of credit. Um, I love using it. Um, our users are always surprised to find out that it's on bubble, which is probably a testament to Bubble and to our designer, um, which was sort of me, but is now somebody else who we both know very well, Kelly. Um, 
Uh, and the product has taken like massive steps forward since she joined the team about six months ago, or maybe more now, eight months ago. Um, uh, let's see. I think limitations that we've run into, there definitely are some. There's no question about it. Um, the main ones I would say relate to collaboration, actually. Um, so since Kelly has joined and actually had another developer on my team last year for a few months, so it wasn't, wasn't the first rodeo around uh, collaboration. Um, but yeah, I think collaboration and bubble can improve quite a bit. And we, we were sort of like talking to them and giving them a lot of feedback on this. So I, I have faith that it will improve. Um, I just don't know how long it will take. Um, but just things around like, you know, we have a pretty big app at this point. Um, I want to know who built that thing or when did that last get changed or like, you know, leave a comment on something and have it ping Kelly, right? Like I want those things, right? That you would expect kind of um just to make it easier to, to manage like the complexity and all the different moving pieces uh, so i think yeah collaboration is, is huge i think the other biggest for, uh, problem that we had is version control um it's sort of collaboration right it wouldn't really be necessary if only one developer was working on it probably um i mean maybe but to a much lesser degree and that depends on like what approach you take but for us we can't really get around without using versions um and like managing and I know there I know bubble is actively working on this piece as well um, but uh, and we've seen some of the designs I think it'll be it'll be great when they have these things um, these improvements um, but yeah like you know merging issues like approving like monitoring auditing changes like knowing what the heck I'm doing as I'm merging two things together like having any visibility into that would be a huge step forward um, we've also run into just like bugs related to merging versions together um, where like we go to ship a feature and then like we, we run into like huge issues and like can't do it for a few days. And that's, those are the moments, those are the mo moments where it's most acute for us. We're like, holy crap, like, can we really do this on bubble? Um, and th those are the things that just give me a little bit of pause, I would say. Um, but aside from that, like, you know, I don't know. I think people may, may, may have fears that like, oh, like it, the performance will be terrible as people start using it um, or you'll like, it's not reliable and maybe you'll lose data. Like we've never had anything like that. Um, of course, we have a lot more scale than we did at the beginning, but we're still relatively small, right? I mean, we have, you know, I guess maybe a total of like 5,000 people, 5,000 users who've ever signed up for SwapSec, but on a weekly basis, probably a few hundred are using it. Um, maybe maybe a little bit more than that. I'm not really sure um, off the top of my head, but um, yeah, like, so this isn't like massive scale yet. So, so TBD, but, um, but yeah, mostly, mostly very positive. Yeah, I feel um, like one of my favorite things too is is when people uh, or just I guess seeing bubble built apps where people don't know that they're bubble built apps, and they're like, "Holy crap, this is you built this without code!" Like that's that's absolutely insane. And I definitely um, felt that looking at Swapstack and going through it for the first time, and um, it's really beautifully, especially that new website that you guys just launched too. I know very recently, it's it's unreal. It looks sick. Um, yeah. So, so just congrats. to be very clear, that website is not a bubble. Um, that website is could, on Webflow. We, it, right. but it could have been. It could have been. Could have been. been. But it's not. Um, I just want to yeah. be honest and transparent. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> um, but but the product itself too, like the parts that are built yeah. on Bubble. I I don't know if you've if you've changed those recently in terms of design, but a that's few, yeah. beautiful too. And like, it mm, feels like a, like any kind of app. I think that you would see. Built I appreciate. Yourself. Yeah, that's definitely um, the goal. I mean. It's actually not the goal. I, I don't know why I said that. Like kind of what we were talking about before, like the, the prettiness of that button is not going to be the reason this fails. Um, and so we've we've tried like, and this is like drives Kelly absolutely crazy because she's a designer and she has a really high bar for what things should look like and feel like. And I appreciate everything you're saying. And I think you're right. I, I think this is actually a really amazing lesson for all of us on the team and maybe anybody else who uses Swapstack um, uh, around like, there is a lot of... Um, uh, what's the right word? Lack of polish, I guess, in lots of different areas. And like, maybe, maybe like I'm very aware of those and most users don't even notice or see half of it. But I think it's a good lesson in, in actually keeping your like scope on things smaller and not worrying too much about how things look as much as you're, as much as you want to. I'm um, just all the things we were talking about before. Um, because at the end of the day, it le and, and, and again, this is a, for our app, right? We are a B2B like, business problem, business solution kind of app. Um, but for us, it's very clear that the, the, the utility for SwapSec is like, how well does this solve the problem, right? And 
we have two types of users and they have different problems um, that we are trying to address. I, you know, if this is a consumer social app, I think it's a completely different ball game and I'm not really well equipped to talk about those or like what matters there. But um, yeah, for us, this type of product for this type of customer, much more important. I mean, you see so many like billion dollar companies whose UIs are just absolutely garbage. Um, and that just proves that like, that's not what matters. Um, so I'm not saying we're like, I, I think we're definitely not all the way on that extreme. Like we do want it to look great. We do want it to feel great to use it. I agree with everything you're saying. Like it does feel like a nice product to use, but I think it, there are many conscious choices we made, made not to like go bigger and harder in that direction of how easy and nice it is. Um, for, for all of those reasons. Yeah. And I think that's a helpful, even just like a mindset to have is to always be framing it in like, okay, look, what are we, what are we actually doing here? How is this solving the ultimate problem? Um, I think it's easy, especially in our, our space to get in the no code space to get caught up with optimizing workflows or optimizing design or optimizing these little things, but, and, and it's easy, very easy to do, but to, to pull yourself back to that fundamental question, like, what am I building? Who is it for? What is it actually doing? Um, yeah. let's, we've been talking, yeah, go ahead. Just on that last point, um, Kelly and I recently have been talking a lot about tech debt. Um, I don't know if everyone listening would really even know what that term means. Uh, certainly might not apply it to like the world of no code that that's even like a possibility, but there's, there's a ton of tech debt that we're, could you, currently. could you define it quickly? Yeah, sure. I don't know if this will be the most concise definition, but the way I think about it is, uh, basically making choices not to, it's kind of like building for scale, right? It's like, um, it's basically moving faster to release features at the expense of, um, either like the future developability of this thing because of like the way we documented it, or maybe it's like the refactored ability of things. Like those are all terrible terms and it doesn't make a ton of sense, but it's like, you know, you can build things in a way that's much, will make it much easier for future you or future team members to like pick it up and develop on top of it in the future. Um, or you can move really fast and it might look kind of crappy, um, not to the user, but to like the, you know, in the editor or something, or like the fields might not like, be named very well or like you know any anything in that world where it's just sort of going to make your you know for a fact this will make your life a little bit harder in the future but you're basically trading off present for future um because you want to move faster and get this thing out um and so we do talk about that all the time and our list of tech debt things is growing <laughs> every week um and we're sort of debating when do we take some time and work on it um you know how how do we think about that decision um so we've been, t we've been talking about it i mean i think it's totally related to like where are you as a company <laughs> and what what do you need to achieve right and if you're at a place where you're like not guaranteed to be alive in a couple of months then probably doesn't make sense to spend a lot of time on tech debt at this point um not to say that that's where swap stack is i'm just using an extreme extreme case um versus if you have like a very stable thing and you're about to go hire 10 engineers and you need them to be able to like pick up your app and start building on it that's probably a great time to start working on tech debt so kind of kind of anywhere along that spectrum you kind of need to have a a finger on the pulse of like where you guys are at and what really matters at this point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if there's um, one thing that I, I think is comforting too, it seems at least from everyone I've talked to, no code or, or code, whatever the company is, that it's kind of an inevitable problem. I, w I was talking to um, one of my buddies who's, who's in the bubble community and his day job is at, he's a product manager at um, this publicly traded tech company. I think, I don't know exactly the one, but it doesn't matter. And um, he was telling me about a project where they were exploring the idea of changing their database, I think. Fundamentally, that's what it was all about. And they spent, I think, a year and a half, God knows how much money, just exploring to like see like what this what it would actually do. And they ended up like abandoning the project in the end because it was just for, for whatever... <laughs> um, was causing a big enough problem for them with their data structure or whatever to spend a year and a half thinking about restructuring it and, and maybe moving to a different database. It proved to be just not worth it. And they stuck with their current tech debt and said, we'll deal with it. Yeah. In Bubble, on a very regular basis, you just encounter, especially as your app gets bigger and bigger, you encounter tons of things where you could use the opportunity to like rebuild the way that system works and then do use that new system for this feature that I'm building because that would be a really nice system. But that's that's a tech debt decision, right? You could say, no, we're not going to do that because actually that's going to add a week to this project and we don't want to do that um, just so that the next project will fit better into that system, right? And so 
that's the sort of thing we're talking about. And yeah, I think it's, I think it's a, a very relevant thing for companies yeah. of all sizes. I've heard um, we're, we're recording this, uh, you know, the holiday season is approaching and I've heard the holiday season is generally when people uh, try to get some of the tech debt dealt with. Yeah. Right. People don't like to ship as much new stuff. Right. This time of year, I guess. Yeah. Right. Um, maybe, maybe we should consider that. So you, you described when you were still running things in the Slack channel, you said, um, that you were in find product market fit mode. Um, you know, it's it's a, at least a year now since then, I think, and you've experienced great growth. Are you still trying to find product market fit? Are you still in that mode? And if you are, how far along are you? That's a good question. I would say, yes, we are still. Um, but I think we've made a lot of progress along the way since then. Um, it's been a really interesting year since the time that I wrote that article. Uh, at that point, so like it's just about a year ago, we were, um, I'll give the one second version of this story, but or maybe maybe 10 second version of the story, but we got acquired by OnDeck in uh, April of 2021 and then spun back out about four months later. It's a whole long story. There's an article that I go into the story there. Um, uh, so around this time last year, we were leaving OnDeck and planning for life as an independent company uh, once again. And... Um, at that point, we were very focused on the one-to-one -one marketplace, which was sort of like the, the eventual evolution of that MVP that we started with, right? Where it's like, we've got newsletters, we've got advertisers, let's try to figure out how to get them in front of each other and, and run sponsorships. Um, the growth we saw into that like end of last year was really awesome and we were feeling very excited about. It, it did kind of start to feel like, oh, this product market fit thing, which is an elusive concept. We can talk about like, what is the definition of that in a sec. Um, but it felt like we were maybe there or getting closer. Um, and then in the new year, things really started shifting. Um, you know, everyone kind of knows like towards like around the end of Q1, there was this like all of a sudden everyone believed there was a recession coming. Um, and so that really impacted things. But even earlier, like uh, what, what we started to see from our advertisers, we saw a few different things. Like one was we didn't have a good way to really drive performance for them. So they were spending a lot of money on our platform, but they weren't really sure what they were getting back for that. And so that's not a, a, a long-term recipe for success, right? If they're they're not going to come back and spend a lot more money if they're not very convinced that it's worth it. Um, and we also were kind of a little contradictory to that, but it was sort of like also this one-to-one -one thing wasn't really a great fit for how advertisers wanted to work. They wanted to, you know, when they go in to advertise on other channels, they're not like doing that anywhere else. They're sort of like running campaigns on other platforms. And so... Yeah, I would say that second piece of feedback, I'm kind of going a little bit backwards, but that second piece of feedback we heard really, really loud and clear into like Q4 last year. So we spent Q1 of this year building a campaign tool that allowed advertisers to spend a lot more money a lot more easily on swap stack. And then this market shift happened at the end of Q1 where the idea of spending a lot more money on an unproven channel became a little bit um, less appealing <laughs> to a lot of advertisers. And so uh, it was kind of like a bad timing thing where it felt like we sort of like built maybe the wrong thing for where the market moved to. Um, and, but that just shifted the focus on performance into much clearer view for us. And so ever since like maybe Q2 of this year, we've been hyper-focused on performance. And so that's materialized in a bunch of different ways. Uh, but the most notable one is we, at a certain point last year had launched, uh, what we called plug and play, which is an affiliate, affiliate program. So advertisers could come on and, uh, basically launch a, a, a per, per conversion deal. So they'd say, oh, you use our link and sign, you know. We'll pay you twenty dollars for every person who signs up, um, but we never really like focused on it. We were seeing momentum in the marketplace, and so we just stuck with that, and so it never picked up a lot of traction. Um, but in Q two this year, we decided to to spend a few a few uh, iterations on the team, like just building a much a much. There were just some obvious things we could do to make the experience better, and that one felt like that was since then, really since like June when we launched some of these improvements. Um, the the uptick in engagement, the plug and play, has been unbelievable. Um, and that's the one that really does feel like that product market fit moment is sort of happening at the, as we speak. Um, it's just it's just like the right fit for both sides of our of our user base, um, and and where the and the market right the market being like a little bit skittish on spending money on things that aren't truly showing ROI. Um, so we're we're really leaning into that, um, building a ton of stuff, a lot of exciting things coming down the road. Um, so. Long way of saying, I think definitely still looking for it, that the, the journey has been definitely not like linear. Uh, it's like, you know, there's the market aspect of product market fit that I think people don't always think about as much. Um, and that was a really good lesson for, for all of us this year. Like, oh, the market can just move out of nowhere. 
Um, uh, so I think we've made some really good decisions and we've, we've, we've kind of ridden the wave as much as we could. Um, but that's made it so that we're still kind of in search of this thing. Yeah. And it's a funny thing to kind of like put your finger on in terms of what that thing that you're searching for is. You alluded to this and in, in, in what you were just saying there, but defining it, I've heard it defined, um, I think in like the YC school of, uh, as like you'll know when you hit it because everything just starts like growing way too fast and you can't control anything and there's this like anxiety and overwhelm that that comes with it do you define it the same way uh or what if what have you heard I've about always, this elusive thing that we're talking yeah, about i've always i've always liked that definition i don't know if i've ever experienced that i wouldn't claim that we've experienced that just yet um we've experienced things all breaking but not for good reasons um one day actually i like set up a weekly email <laughs> Uh, in bubble and I was I took the morning off the the first day that I was going to start sending um, which it didn't even feel like a risky thing to be launching I've done like 10 of these before like uh, but for whatever reason I messed up the conditional on it so it just looped infinitely for every user so every user who was scheduled to get that email started getting an email every four seconds from us um, and I was at the I was at a museum with my girlfriend or something. We like took the day off and like went to downtown DC and it was just so bad. So bad. <laughs> Kelly was like frantically trying to reach me. Oh, it was the worst. Cause she didn't, you know, she hadn't built it. She didn't know exactly what it was. Uh, so that was terrible. Um, <laughs> but, um, so it's a classic bubble story. Um, um, I actually really like, so I do like that definition. I think uh, the way Jake, I don't know if we we don't talk, we don't use that term product market fit all that often internally, to be totally honest, but um, there's a phrase that he uses a lot as we kind of figure out what we should be prioritizing that I think is really relevant here and, and really smart. And it's like, what's easy right now? Like what's actually happening that we're not like, feel like we're like pulling teeth to make it happen, right? So like, and, and plug and play right now is is that, right? It's just happening. Um, like we're like, yeah, maybe it's not like so active that we like can't control it, but it is just better than we thought it was going to be. And that's like a really cool feeling. And it's consistently been that way now for like five months in a row. Um, and so, yeah, hopefully it continues. Um, I think we have a lot of good ideas of how to keep it continue, you know, make it continue. But um, yeah, I think it's like, I, the, the, you'll know it when you feel it, I think is the, 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 maybe the more, the part that I uh, resonate more than like the, your phones are gonna be blowing up off the hook or whatever. Um, it's like, when something is hard and it's not right, you kind of can feel it. Your users are kind of just like resisting it just a little bit more than you think they should. Um, and, and the inverse also, you just kind of feel it. Yeah. I love that. And the older I get, I think like the more that becomes, um, something that I look for in like all aspects of life is just like easy. Like we were talking about, you know, meeting, uh, your co-founder before and relationships. It's like the best relationships that I have, uh, whether they're romantic relationships or, or you know, uh, with business partners, they're always just easy. And that's not e easy in the sense that it just like feels kind of effortless. And there's not that like friction there. It's not to say that there's not hard work. There's hard work with anything. But um, I like that for an approach to product too and the features that you're building. Yeah, it's true. I mean, it, but then the, the flip side of that is like, it's not... The, the implication of that is that if it isn't easy, you should discard it. And so the, so the question is, where do you draw that line? And, and I don't think there's a, I don't think there's one answer to that. I don't think I have any of the answers to that, but I think that is the, like the sort of like, so therefore what, when it isn't easy, you know? Um, and I think that's a lot more complicated than the, like, like it's great when it's easy. That's awesome. But what about when it isn't easy? Like, what do you do about that? Um, if somebody knows, please reach out, <laughs> leave a comment. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a tricky dance for sure. Okay, last uh, last question for you. Um, if you could, going back to the start now, take this concept of a flywheel, but instead of thinking about it in terms of how it applies to, to different companies, think about it in terms of how it's applied to yourself. So those like character, tra whatever it is, like those those character traits that you've that you have or you've developed, events in your life, relationships, people you've met, whatever it is that have compounded over time that have allowed you to get to where you are today and, and allowed you to experience this success. And I know, of course, you, you, uh, you have a lot more success and a lot, uh, a, a lot farther to go. But what are those uh, flywheels for you personally? Man, that is a good question. And I was not prepared for that question. So <laughs> I'm going to have to riff on this. Um, um, man. 
So the flywheels, I'm going to just like think out loud for a second. We can cut this part maybe. Um, so you're asking the flywheels of like looking backwards to now, essentially. Mm -hmm. Okay. Those, those things that have developed that, that you've developed, whatever it is. When I was reading through your article, you were talking about like different flywheels at companies and kind of like defining each one in terms of how it kind of like feeds into another. You talked about it for, for swap stack too. So that concept, but in a personal sense. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, the thing that comes to mind for me first is relationships, personal relationships with people in my life. Um, I've been really, and this is connected to our conversation, like the co-founder relationship specifically is like a new one in my life, that concept. Um, it's been really interesting to see how the things I'm learning in that relationship of like how to basically do that better um, are helping me in other relationships in my life. And then also how, you know, my other relationships in my life are helping me be a better co-founder and in that relationship as well. So I think like there's really interesting analogs there um, between my co-founder relationship, my, you know, my, my romantic relationship, my, my girlfriend, um, my family, like my friends, like there's a lot of, they're all different, but they're all the same in, in the same way, in some way. Um, so I think there's for sure the last like year or two, I've been really aware of all of that. Um, in terms of other stuff, yeah, I don't know. Um, I mean, for a while, I, like I said before, I was really interested in this idea of like, working on a lot of different projects that all kind of like kind of were a web of things that kind of all self reinforced. Um, and, and I do think that like the experience, like every it's, it's almost been more of like a linear path than like a flywheel in this like web of connecting things, because like, I really, it's very clear to me to see how the, the like the Amazon led to the flywheel led to swap stack. Um, and, and so there's, there is an, a bit of like that linear element to it, but I think there's like for sure a, um, like, and I, I stopped writing the flywheel recently, like about a year ago, because I just decided to focus on this. <laughs> um, and, and, and actually there's a whole other thread there of like what it was like to be a writer with pressure to like produce good content. And, and it decided that it was too much for me. Um, so it's not answering your question at all anymore. I'm just kind of talking. <laughs> um, no, but like experiences, like learning from experiences and just kind of it, like that, that concept of iterating, I think, and being able to like take a step back and look at, what that experience has taught you and I mean iterating no, and improving along the way yeah it's true I mean I, I I think I have really at least at this moment that we're talking in November 20 whatever year it is um, like I feel like I have really come on a bit of a journey from like I think for a really long time for a really long time, I felt a lot of pressure to like be ambitious. Um, you know, I like went to business school at a good business school. I like went to Amazon. I was around a lot of people who were at least like presenting themselves as very ambitious people. And I felt a lot of pressure to like be that way. Um, and ambitious in like the very standard sense of like American capitalist system ambitious. Um, and <laughs> I had this conversation at some point last year and I kind of said something similar to this. And he was like, so you're writing a newsletter, you started a startup and you're claiming that you're not ambitious. So like, I understand how maybe it doesn't sound like totally credible, but like truly the idea of like, actually we don't want to go try to become a unicorn and like IPO. Like to me, that's a manifestation of this as well. Um, it, ultimately it's more about like, I think it's just become very clear to me in my life that like the symbols of success in society aren't what make people happy. They're certainly, or I can't speak for other people, but they certainly are not what make me happy. Um, and so just trying to like really just evaluate all the things in my life and like filter them through, like, is this something I'm doing? Cause I think it's what I want to make me happy. Or is this something that I'm doing because, you know, any number of external other reasons, like, cause I think it's what I'm supposed to do. It's cause like for whatever reason I, you know, I'm trying to basically check myself on those things. Um, so I don't know if that's a flywheel, but I feel like it's, it's kind of connected to everything because it's like as I'm exploring that, it's like, that's a big topic to explore. It's not like a project that you just like check off the box in a couple of weeks. Um, so I'm still learning about all of that for myself. But like, as I do that, I'm learning about how that impacts 
what I want to do at work and how that impacts on you know everything else in my life. So, um, so yeah, I would go with that. Awesome. Well, Jake, thanks so much for for coming on and sharing your your story with all the listeners here. And um, yeah, it was great. It's great talking to you. I love following Swapstack and all of the stuff that you guys are doing, and it's very inspiring to um, see these announcements that you guys make about all of these, whatever it is, a big feature that you've shipped or a big week that you've had in terms of numbers, whatever it is. So keep going. And uh, I know you will, but yeah, it's, it's encouraging and very inspiring for a lot of people, I think. So thanks for coming on and yeah. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Awesome. Thanks for watching everyone. Bye-bye.